Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and in the aftermath of the midterm elections and the sweeping victory of the Republican Party, politics is in the air. The political pendulum, which always swings back and forth in America, seems to have swung to the right. Does it mean anything in particular for American Jewry? Does it mean anything for U.S. relations with the State of Israel? What's it mean in terms of Iran's going nuclear? And how does the Jewish community feel now about President Barack Obama and his relationship with Prime Minister Netanyahu and the State of Israel? These are questions that set the context for this week's roundtable discussion with a panel of exceptional individuals who will be sharing their insights and perspectives on issues that are confronting Jewish life today. Let me introduce them to you. Dr. Stephen Baim is the director of the Contemporary Jewish Life Department of the American Jewish Committee and their Koppelman Institute on American-Jewish-Israeli Relations. Rabbi Eric Yaffe is immediate past president of the Union for Reform Judaism, and currently Eric is a columnist appearing in the Huffington Post, Haaretz, and the Jerusalem Post. And you can also read Eric's pieces at ericyaffe.com. Betty Ehrenberg is the executive director of the World Jewish Congress for North America. And Dr. Charles Small is the founder and director of ISGAP, the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. And Charles is also the Corit Distinguished Scholar at the Hoover Institution of Stanford University. And I thank each of you for joining me. Thank you for joining L'Chaim and JBS and being willing to share your ideas with our audience. I'm most appreciative. Um, so let me tell you what's on my mind, and then I want all of you to just kind of just respond. And it has to do with what I hear almost everywhere I go about the way in which Jews are talking about the American administration in general and Barack Obama in particular in the aftermath of this election. And I'm sure many of you saw Jeffrey Goldberg's recent piece in The Atlantic, which he entitled, Crisis in U.S.-Israel Relations is Officially Here. And it included the fact that someone at the Obama administration referred to Prime Minister Netanyahu as chicken shit. The Goldberg piece also suggests that perhaps in the upcoming UN, uh, U UN Security Council session in January, the Obama administration will either refrain from vetoing Palestinian attempts for UN membership or will exercise its veto in return for severe anti-settlement resolution that would further isolate, Goldberg says, Israel in the international community. How do you assess President Obama's relationship either to Prime Minister Netanyahu in particular or in general, the administration's view of the state of Israel? Well, clearly the tone between uh, the U.S. administration and Israel has, uh, has uh, shifted for the worse. And in that respect, uh, some of the uh, graphic uh, verbiage that, uh, that Goldberg quotes is, uh, is quite disturbing. Uh, if you go past the tone, uh, bear in mind, U.S. policy since day one, back in June, June 10, 1967, or whatever is the end of the Six-Day War, U.S. policy has been consistent in opposing West Bank settlements. So in that respect, there's a need for some historical perspective here. The U.S.-Israel special relationship, which does go back certainly to the Johnson years, it's had rough spots, mm -hmm. whether it was the Carter years. Carter, by the way, very much wanted a, a resolution against settlements. He got it and he was quickly condemned for it, and uh, it was during an election year, and he paid for it. At least he paid for it in terms of the Jewish vote. That's the only time, the, uh, it's the only time since 1928 that Jews have actually voted against the Democratic candidate, whether it was Reagan or Anderson. Uh, the Carter administration was the only time that happened. The first Bush with loan guarantees, there were also some rough spots. I think what's important for American Jews to realize is that the, um, the forces stabilizing a, uh, a special relationship between Israel and, and the United States are bipartisan forces. They transcend party politics. 
We've had problems at times with the left wing of the Democratic Party. We've had problems at times with uh, uh, a more uh, isolationist wing of the Republican Party. But the overall trajectory between the U.S. and Israel has been quite stable mm -hmm. and quite sound for a good many decades. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I don't want to sound Pollyannish, but uh, I'm still hopeful that um, notwithstanding some rough spots that are ahead, and I think Goldberg has pointed to a couple of them that we should be uh, very, uh, very wary of, and uh, I could do without some of the verbiage and language, and I would prefer a much more positive tone. But um, when at the end of the day, uh, U.S.-Israel relations go beyond personalities, and they go beyond party politics. Are you saying, in essence, the tone, while it bothers you, is not really significant? A to the tone is disturbing, because I would have expected more statesmanship. Um, but uh, in terms of the substance of policy, the question is, will the United States remain Israel's primary friend? And for that, on those grounds, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sanguine. OK. Eric, how do you read it? I'm basically in agreement uh, with what Steve says. Uh, I'm someone who feels it really doesn't make that much difference if we have a Republican administration or if we have a Democratic administration. Uh, there aren't two separate policies. There's one American foreign policy with regards to Israel. And I agree with it that it's been remarkably consistent now for quite some uh, time. I think that in terms of verbiage, uh, I mean, the adolescent, adolescent insults were just outrageous. And uh, unfortunately, we should remember the verbiage has been on both sides. Um, it has been handled uh, well by the Obama administration in some cases. But uh, at the same time, senior officials in the uh, Israeli government have made a whole series of mistakes on their own. Um, for example? Uh, for example, Ya'alon, uh, the, essentially the, the number two person in the government of Israel, uh, the defense minister, he made, made very unfortunate comments uh, in January about Secretary Kerry, followed up again by additional unfortunate comments uh, in March. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has appeared to interfere in American elections, which uh, is not in Israel's interest. We need to you know, main, maintain bipartisan support. That's not the way to, uh, to do it. Um, and by the way, Yalon had to apologize. He had to apologize, and his, his apology was a half-hearted apology. Absolutely no reason for that. You simply apologize. You simply apologize. Um, Prime Minister Netanyahu, the night before his meeting, with President Obama, had a very public meeting with Sheldon Adelson in New York. And Sheldon Adelson um, hates the president, <laughs> sees him as Satan, spent ten million, tens of millions of dollars to get him uh, defeated. And uh, if, if uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu wants to meet an old friend, that's fine. I don't have any issue with that. Let him do it in the privacy of his hotel suite. Mm -hmm. And uh, not in a very public way. And I, uh, look, I'm, I'm also distressed every time there's a meeting between an Israeli and, a, um, and uh, an American, uh, there doesn't have to be an announcement of a Jewish settlement. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that also happened this time. If announcements are to be made, there are a hundred different ways to make those announcements. It is almost as if they're looking to pick a fight. It's simply unnecessary. We have two allies. We share values. We share strategic concerns. Nobody needs to be picking a fight with anybody. And you're afraid Israel picks a fight, a fight with the United States? I think on both sides, the relationship has not been handled well. Differences are best handled behind closed doors. That's how friends act with each other. That's how you resolve differences. You don't do it in a public arena. And what I'm suggesting on both sides, there seems to have been you know, a lack of awareness that that's how one best proceeds. OK, Betty. Do you agree with what's been said, or do you have a different perspective? Um, I feel that uh, I do agree with the fact that there is um, a solid relationship there. No, it doesn't matter who the president is of the United States. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who the prime minister is. There is a fundamental uh, sharing of interests, strategic values, um, uh, commercial, all kinds of interests that are between Israel and the United States. Uh, the United States needs the democracy called Israel in the Middle East in its neighborhood where it's situated. Let's look and see what's happening around it. It's just frightful. Um, and I, so that doesn't matter. Obama and Bibi do not have to be best friends, but America and Israel have to be the best of allies. So this is really what's important over here. 
and uh, a tone is important. Nevertheless, I would take issue with the tone of Jeffrey's article and not call it a crisis. I don't think you have to manufacture a crisis, and I think that's not helpful to anybody. It's not helpful to the United States nor Israel, and it only uh, uh, makes uh, our common enemies happy. So I don't think it's a crisis. I think that, first of all, um, we need to be careful about what we call settlements and not settlements. The settlement community actually happens to be very upset with Bibi Netanyahu at the moment, and they feel he isn't doing anything for them and has not built for them, and that he has uh, enacted some sort of de facto freeze uh, without saying it or calling it and that uh, building in Jerusalem, at least to uh, many of the Jewish people and many of the Israelis, is not considered uh, settlement building. Nevertheless, uh, yes, I think it would be good if on both sides they would tone down uh, 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 rhetoric and tone down uh, the uh, heat. But I think, that, I think what that does do is undermine, at least the, to public opinion or in the public, and, makes to see, and it makes it seem as though there is a rift between the two countries. I don't think there is basically a rift between the two countries. I think congressional support for Israel is solid. I think if you look at all the polls, popular support for Israel is solid. And uh, we've been through this before, as Steve said. We've been through this with... Uh, uh, James Baker and George H.W. Bush and Yitzhak Shamir. We have been through this with uh, other secretaries of state and other close advisors to presidents. And there have been, uh, this has always been uh, at some level. Never do the best friends agree on everything, as Eric said. So I don't think that we're at a crisis, and I don't think that we should make uh, seem as if some sort of a crisis is ballooning, even though it might sell copies of okay. uh, newspapers. Okay. Well, Charles, do you see it the same way or slightly differently? I think I see it slightly differently. Um, I would say that if a president of the United States, a previous president of the United States, called, for example, an African leader a piece of, I don't even know if I can say it on television, mm -hmm. but a piece of you-know-what, I think there'd be a public outcry and a serious backlash. And that person who said those disgusting words would have been called on the mat and dismissed publicly. And that has not happened. He's been protected or she's been protected um, by the administration. And I think that's um, a very ugly message. And we can read it and debate it in one way, but that message is also being projected around the world to the Middle East and to Europe. And I think our standing as a community is uh, in a very ugly way diminished. And I think we have to see what's happening not just domestically but internationally. And I think this type of um, sort of framing the Jewish community and Jewish power in a certain way uh, is having an effect internationally. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that has been sort of consistent. This is not just a one-off uh, problem. And I think the fact that uh, President Obama and the General Assembly uh, seem to endorse the work of the second in command of the Muslim Brotherhood, who uh, has, you know, this, they're basically uh, inherently using anti Semitism as a way to further their objective. It's inherent in their narrow uh, interpretation of Islam. And for the President of the United States in the General Assembly to endorse this anti Semitic reactionary social movement is problematic. The fact today. Um, the Wall Street Journal in Haaretz is reporting the fact that Obama sent a, a, a confidential letter to uh, Ayatollah Khomeini to uh, talk about the common interests vis-a-vis uh, -vis ISIS in the Middle East. These are all, there's, there's, a, there's a general tone internationally. These issues are um, of crucial importance. We're at a moment where the, I think the, the future of Israel, the future of the Jewish people, is literally hanging in the balance, and we are talking about sideshows. And th there's a reactionary social movement afoot in the Middle East, which is slaughtering people as we speak. The centrifuges are, are, are spinning, and anti-Semitic rhetoric is in the air. And I think this is a very serious time. And it's true, I agree with Betty, the Congress and the Senate and uh, the relations with Israel and the United States at many levels are very strong, even now. But things are happening that I think the community really needs to take stock of and discuss openly and I think take a very strong principled position, not only in the name of our community, but in the name of human rights and human decency. I know there's a Jewish revulsion from Obama, and I'm not, last thing I'm going to do is give you a, a pro-Obama statement at this point. But uh, the revulsion is, um, first of all, it's not reflected, by the way, in the voting patterns. Um, if, if anything, the most recent poll was that, uh, you know, Jews would, Jews voted for Obama, I think, 70 percent. Uh, Higher. 
even higher. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so he may he may have lost a few points. And they voted Democratic. They continue the to vote Democratic. Absolutely. Exactly. So in the, in that context, there there are those who have a revulsion from Obama. Yes. There, and may, may I just say this? Sure. There are people who say, however, that the vast majority of Jews who are voting, who are in that seventy to eighty percent, are not seventy to eighty percent of Jews who are concerned with, involved with, committed to the state of Israel, and that the real concern I hear being discussed is people con say to me all the time, and I'm not, this is not necessarily my opinion, but I want you to hear what people are saying to me. When they call uh, JBS or when I meet them in the street, I don't understand how committed Jews are voting for Obama. It's not that they're saying that the, the, the sky is falling on Israeli U.S. relations, but they don't understand how Jews committed to the state of Israel, who are worried about the future of the state of Israel, who are very worried about Iran's possible going nuclear, are supporting a president which they see the committed Jewish, those committed to Israel, who they see as a president that doesn't get it and that is not as committed to uh, the security of the state of Israel as they would like it to, like him to be. What we're concerned with now, the Jews tell me, is what's going to happen in the next year and two years, in the next two years of, of President Obama's uh, stay here. And when you read Goldberg saying, you know, I, I'm not so sure that the Obama administration is committed to a veto in the UN Security Council. And if I hear people say, are really settlements really what the issue are, is that is keeping peace from the Middle East? And if that's the focus, is it the correct focus? So my question for you is, as you, you know, you're about as, as committed both to the Jewish tradition and Israel as anybody I've ever spoken to. It's from your perspective, not the 80% of Jews, most of whom aren't really in this discussion, that I want to hear how you view it. And I, I, I appreciate that you're, you're side of side, trying to you know, say the sky isn't falling. And yet at the same time, I don't want you, as you say, to be Pollyanna about it. I want as much of your hard analysis, Steve, as you can give me. The hard analysis is that the, uh, the bases for U.S. support for Israel are fourfold. Uh, number one, the sense that Israel remains a, a fellow democracy. Number two, that America is a fundamentally religious country. And in being a fundamentally re religious country, it sees Israel as the fulfillment of biblical values. Number three, the fact is, throughout Israel's history, including up to today, and you mentioned, alluded to before, Israel and the United States have faced common foes. And number four, most critically to me, is yes, the vigilance, the pressure, the uh, intensive involvement of a vibrant Jewish community that wants to keep the United States and Israel in as, on a, as even a keel, and as close, as close a line as possible. Perhaps what's most distressing to me in terms of uh, yesterday's elections, one poll I saw, may not be definitive, is that uh, only 8% of American Jews regarded Israel as one of the two key issues on which they would cast their ballots. 0% mm -hmm. regarded Iranian and nuclear bomb as being an issue. In that respect, my, my real concern is that when American Jews stop caring about these issues, that's when you see U.S.-Israel relations go south. Okay, I, I'm almost done, then I'll go to shore. Sure. Are you telling me that basically you're not concerned that the Obama administration would take a stand in the UN harmful to Israel. You're not concerned about that. I didn't say that. I said, I said we. If you are concerned, we, I want to hear it. Are yeah. you concerned? I think it's it's a definite possibility, and it will be uh, along the lines of the sort of things we weathered during the Carter years. And, are you uh, and are you worried that the Obama administration will accept a deal with Iran that will in fact be bad I'm for so, Israel? No question. I'm concerned about that. Okay, yes. you have now identified the two most critical issues. There, this has nothing to do with Congress and the United States and Israel. This has to do with the areas in which the American administration has a unique power. And that's what people are focusing on. It's not about whether in, in some global way Israel and the United States will stop being friends. No one's worried about that. But they are concerned that the current administration may take stands that will be practically injurious to the state of Israel. And I, that's what I'm asking the, the four and, of you uh, to speak And were they, were they to take those stands, which I admit is a good possibility, they will hear from the Jewish community in very strong language, including from us. Anything you want to add? 
I think we have to be very careful not to demonize President Obama or his administration. I don't think it contributes uh, to the conversation. And I, I, have to th I also think we have to be careful about playing games with numbers. I mean, if you look at American Jews have a deep commitment to Israel. If you look back at the Pew study, I looked at those numbers. I felt the numbers were pretty good. They showed across the board that ties uh, are strong. Now, the fact that Israel may not be the reason that they voted doesn't mean that you know, concerns about Israel weren't part of their calculation. I look at the fact that 70% of American Jews um, voted uh, Democratic um, as an indication that they do not see Obama as an enemy of the, of the Jewish state. And the fact of the matter, he isn't an enemy of the Jewish state. He's had some problems. He's had some issues on which I disagree. I think on strategic and military questions, he's been superb, probably better than, than uh, any of his uh, predecessors. And um, look, I, I, I think if you, if you look at the big question, to me the big question is Iran. Uh, I Iran presents uh, a short-term, potentially existential danger to Israel's existence. Uh, so that's what I worry about most. And I also happen to think at this moment that uh, a number of things that uh, need to happen. I think American Jews need to be more engaged. This election was not about foreign policy. Iran was barely mentioned. And I also think that the state of Israel could be helpful here by some priority setting, meaning Iran is essential to their future. Issues of settlement and building in Jerusalem, I agree it's not settlement, it's building, Thank you. are not essential, are not existential issues at this particular moment for the, the state of Israel. I think it would be helpful for Israel's government in order to strengthen relations with an ally whose support is needed on Iran to make some concessions when it comes to these other areas in order to accede to the American request to lower the temperature okay. on Israeli palestinian And what would a, con how would a concession express it? What kind of concession? I think it would be easy for the government of Israel and for the United States, without going into details, to work out an agreement in terms of what was acceptable and what was not in terms of settlement. Settlement building within the block, but not outside the block. Some system of coordination and cooperation where the, that the Americans would know what would be done and they would have their input. I don't think we have to work out the details here. But right now, with Israeli elections coming, and that's, that's key, let's not forget that. Much of what's happened in the last number of weeks is motivated by electoral concerns, which are always part of the picture. We're not naive here. But at a certain point, the common good has to transcend the immediate electoral concerns. My fear is that uh, settlement issues are going to overwhelm the agenda, with the impact being that on truly essential issues such as Iran, they're going to get pushed aside when they really need to be given in priority. In Israel. Uh, in Israel and in relations between Israel and uh, the United okay. States. I want to ask you the same questions I asked mm -hmm. Steve. Do you worry that this administration would do something in the UN injurious to Israel? My primary worry is Iran, which is not essentially a UN issue. So, um, Palestinian statehood. I think there's some reasons for concern there. Um, and, and I think, you know, we need to watch that. I think we need to be sending a message to the American administration. I think we also need to ask the Israelis to cooperate on a settlement policy that has been disastrous for Israel and world opinion, that is not supported by anybody, and that every administration, Republican and Democratic, going back for the, you know, to, for the last 20 or 30 years, has opposed. Okay, and the other thing is, do you worry that the Obama administration will not take the proper stand on Iran? I am concerned about that, yes. I, I think that needs to be our first priority right now. Mm -hmm. So far, both of you have said yes to both concerns. You've heard what Eric and Steve have to say. Anything at all, and then I'm asking you the same question. Are you concerned that the Obama administration may take a stand inside the Security Council injurious to Israel? Do you worry that the Obama administration will not take the appropriate stand against a nuclear Iran? I think it would be so out of turn, it would be so out of character for the United States to take uh, a stand in the, in the Security Council injurious to Israel. I, I wouldn't say it couldn't happen, but I would be so shocked uh, 
So it doesn't really worry you. It, it worries me, but I, I don't I don't think it would be as much I don't think it's as much of a possibility of happening as I think the second uh, issue would be would happen, which is that uh, the the stand uh, regarding Iran, the position on Iran, or going for a deal that's really less than optimal will, will happen, and I think that is a possibility. What I think that we should be doing, I mean, let's just focus on a minute on what we really should be doing, and that is should be uh, heavily engage with the administration, meeting with the administration, and talking about it and, um, on both things, on both issues. Uh, in a sense, they are related because of their, they, as Steve said, these are two important issues. They are, they are existential to Israel. Uh, we are not looking to look uh, to see any more isolation of Israel in the international community, although it is pretty much isolated in the international community. However, it's pretty much isolated in the UN. I wouldn't say that that really is true bilaterally with many, many, many countries. Uh, there are a lot of, you, if you speak to a lot of UN ambassadors, which I do all the time, they'll say, you know, well, Betty, this is the system here, but you know, my heart is not really in this vote. This is how we do it because uh, this is the culture that we have in the United Nations. And it is a sort of its own little, um, uh, I don't know, beehive in a sense. Uh, but, it, but a lot of that does not necessarily play, necess what happens there does not necessarily play out in the real world. And that's very, very important mm -hmm. to remember. So I don't think that we should panic about it. Uh, but the second one, the, the, the issue of Iran is very, very worrisome. And I think it is because, not because people don't care, or not because, but I think because people aren't aware of the danger. To them, this thing is still geographically very, very far away. The threat is not understood. It's not understood as something that can really harm the United States. The Europeans, which, who are much, much closer to the source of the threat, who are really vulnerable now because the missiles that they have, that the Iranians have, can reach Europe and beyond. This is not understood and not, not, it has not been fully absorbed. So I think that's very important, and I'm, I am fearful that the Obama administration, not because of any malicious intent, but out of some sort of naivete or um, not getting it, as somebody said here before, uh, might make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Betty, do you ever hear committed American Jews rail against Barack Obama? Oh, yes, I do. Can you articulate what one or two of the major criticisms you hear from committed Jews who, by the way, I don't think they have any intention of leaving the Democratic Party. They just feel at the moment President Obama does not reflect what they wish the president would reflect vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Can you articulate one or two of the criticisms you hear all the time? One of, one of the criticisms is regarding the tone and a seeming lack of respect towards the Prime Minister. Um, the the uh, reverberation still from that very first speech in Cairo, yeah. uh, putting the settlements on the table, saying that settlements are illegal when they're not illegal. That's just, I mean, that gets bandied, that phrase gets bandied about and has sort of worked itself now into some sort of established and accepted truth. It is not. Um, <clears throat> that has been deleterious. But I think you have to take, again, step back. It's very important to step back. The military to military situ uh, relationship is rock solid. That's important. Let's talk Tachlis for a second. Uh, Iron me, Dome is the there, and there was an increase in the amount of money yes, for that. But at the moment, what, uh, every time this is discussed, I hear somebody say, but during the Gaza War, President Obama threatened not to re replenish Israeli arms. Now, I'm with, thinking of, of President Nixon in the 1970s. Yes, right now we're war. talking about President Obama. So that everybody, I think there's universal agreement that militarily and in terms of intelligence, as Eric said, there's been spectacular cooperation. But it's cooperation on a different level. There was an issue during the Gaza war where the president said he was not going to send weapons, re re replenish the weapons of Israel because he didn't like the way Israel was conducting the Gaza war. Am I telling you something you don't know? No, you're not. Uh, I guess what I, I think that was damaging and deleterious, and I think it cost the Democrats points now in this election. I think uh, wh whoever runs for president on the Democratic ticket in the next election 
uh, will be looked at with more wariness and skepticism on the part of uh, our community. Uh, so that has had an effect, no doubt about it. But I think that uh, underneath, I think we'll weather this. I guess I, I just, okay. uh, I think that right. we're going to weather this. I understand. I'm only trying to understand the extent to which the four of you feel this is an issue, number one, that should be addressed publicly. And what does it mean for the American Jewish community and their, their feeling about the president at the moment? Now, you knew about this as well, that the president had serious problems. At one point, he was not going to send arms. And he, he was critical of the way Israel conducted Operation Protective Edge. So I'm asking you, number one, the same question I've asked the others. Do you worry at all that the United States might take a position in the Security Council or might take a position on Iran going nuclear that would be deleterious to the state of Israel? And you know, what do you, when you hear people critical of the president, what do you hear and what's your response? So I would respond by saying, you know, I don't think anybody's demonizing President Obama, but as Jews, we are we we learn to judge action. We don't know what's in somebody's heart. We we see tachlis what's happening on the ground, and what's happening on the ground is is disturbing. Um, I think the fact that the Obama administration uh, forced tried to force uh, Turkey and Qatar into the ceasefire agreement with the Israeli war against Hamas is uh, problematic and troubling, and I think it not only shocked. Israelis, and it not only shocked people uh, on the left, on the right in Israel, it shocked the Egyptians, it shocked the Saudis, it shocked the Jordanians, and I believe it shocked even Fatah. So why was the administration pushing the Muslim Brotherhood ultimately into this equation? Um, so I think there's things that are happening on the ground that are of, of great importance and significance, and we as a community need to put this into a context, to contextualize it. And if the administration is courting uh, Turkey and courting Qatar, we as a community need to understand the ramifications of that. And if this administration continues to do it, and the Obama administration will be most free in the next two years uh, on foreign policy issues, that's the one space they'll be least constrained. Uh, so I don't think there'll be a lame duck president on this issue. Uh, it's, it's very concerning and we need to understand what's happening. And I think the fact that we are sitting here on November the 6th, and we are not certain what the administration is going to do vis-a-vis -vis Iran a couple of weeks away from the, from the deadline, while the centrifuges continue to spin and the sanctions, san the sanctions regime has been weakened in recent months. I think it's profoundly troubling, and I think the chicken shit reference to that was sort of um, ridiculing the Prime Minister of the Jewish State on such a sensitive issue, kind of making fun of him, they didn't have the, the chutzpah uh, to do anything vis-a-vis -vis Iran, and tying into, you know, very ancient old stereotypes of Jewish male femininity and inability to fight, I, I find that really extraordinarily disgusting, especially at this moment in history. And I think these are very serious issues that we need to discuss openly and, 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 um, and without any reservations, not to demonize anybody, but to talk about reality and context and what are we going to do as a community. What do you think? I think it, it sounds a lot like demonizing uh, the president, even though you're, you're, These are just facts. you're, you're, yeah. you're suggesting not. Uh, They're just I look facts. At, I look at the war in Gaza. I'm not demonizing anybody, though. I'm just stating well-researched uh, well uh, facts. E Erdan. A week ago, he's just been a, uh, was going to be appointed um, interior minister, the government of Israel, um, talked about Kerry in terms of moral debasement. Again, this is a, a, a senior minister about to take a more senior position who's using that terminology in a very public statement um, about one of uh, America's senior officials. And your point is? My point is that kind of thing needs to stop on both sides. President, uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu did not dismiss him and did not rebuke him. That has become the kind of language that leaders on both sides are using against each other. It's the Naftali Bennett, I can't even start, I don't have time, in terms of, of the kinds of things he has said about 
American leadership and about, okay. and about you, Kerry. And you feel in some way this is an answer to Charles? So what I'm, what I'm suggesting is why, why blame we, the Israelis we, we can't, we can't simply look at one side and, and, or the other and say that this is, this is what they're saying. Are you the, only blaming the is, They're both doing it. No, I, I think I'm, what I'm arguing is, first of all, I'm not demonizing anybody. I'm just, I'm just repeating well-substantiated facts on the ground. But I'm saying, forget the Israelis, forget the Muslim Brotherhood, forget the Qataris, the Turks, the, the Egyptians. Let's have a discussion here. What, what, is, what is happening in the United States of America with American foreign policy? And what is the Jewish community? And what is the human rights community? What should we do? I think so, that's, look, I, I think that's fair. I, I look at the war in Gaza, you made several references. First of all, let's praise Prime Minister Netanyahu, who handled it adeptly and moderately and appropriately. He needs to be given full credit. He's somebody who doesn't rush into war. This is really his first war, so to speak. Uh, he, he handled it the way we would expect, and he, he deserves uh, our thanks. It was consistent you know, with the highest Jewish uh, values. Generally speaking, the Americans were supportive from beginning to end. I realize you have issues. Uh, I think the Israelis did pretty good, first of all, in, in uh, eliciting support. I think the Americans did a very good job in, in providing it, and the truth of the matter is the European governments did reasonably well in that regard Yeah, but as you well. have to also address how you feel about President Obama at one point saying, I'm not going to replenish arms because I'm not happy with what Israel is doing in Gaza. And stopping travel to the airport at, at a crucial moment. Well, I don't moment. think he did that. But be that as it may, I just want to know, I do know that he took a stand on rearming Israel, and he was critical of the way Israel was conducting the Gaza war. And what I'm saying is, it's the big picture questions here. In other words, I could give you a list, my own list, of issues that I have <laughs> with President Obama. <laughs> the United States acted appropriately supportive of Israel in a war that was hardly uh, popular around the world. And generally speaking, I think their policy was uh, what we expected it to be and okay. what it should be. Did any of the three of you have any trouble with American foreign policy during the Gaza war? Again, there were blips on the screen. And, but basically uh, not. Basically, the overall picture is what Eric described. Basically, do you have any trouble with the way the Obama I do have problems when the, when the, you know, I think there are two levels. There's always what's said in public and what's said in the media and what's said uh, in the press and then what's really going on behind the scenes and what really, and what is really happening. I would like the two to mesh more. I don't think it's how, I, I understand why things are said for public consumption. I understand why things are said uh, uh, by Ban Ki-moon. I understand why things are said by, se by Secretary Kerry. Uh, and I think that, uh, and I, I understand why United Nations ambassadors say what they say. And I, but I wish that these things would not be said. I wish what, uh, what was really felt and what is, and the solidarity that was shown and not, not, so that we would not have to sit here and say, well, uh, in the end, they came through and they were supportive. Never mind the noise. Because I think the noise is damaging. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very, very problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 would, I do want you to comment. And I find myself in a little bit of an uncomfortable position because again, I don't, I'm not here at the moment to bash President Obama or the way the United States handled the, the issue during the Iraq War. I'm sorry, the Gaza War. But... Every day, I am watching intently how American television presented, covered, and depicted the, the Gaza war. And Israel was hammered, viciously hammered, as if Israel were callously killing children on the streets of Gaza. And no, almost no channel ever said, any time Hamas wants, the war can end. All they have to do is stop firing rockets. And I did not feel that the President of the United States came out strongly enough in support of the State of Israel's efforts to defend itself. Not that he didn't say it in certain ways, but that for me it wasn't said clearly enough. And I believe in essence you, you had an American media which was picking up on at least the ambivalence of the Obama administration, if not a certain kind of criticism. And the criticism was throughout Europe, and, and it was, uh, you know, and one of the things we did, and many of you sitting, some of you sitting here right now, were part of our Israel in Turmoil series, and you spoke eloquently, but people said to me continuously, 
the only place that you could hear an Israeli perspective or an Israeli voice was Shalom TV during, the, during, that, during this past summer. And it bothered me. And I'm, I'm not sure I, I, you, the four of you, share the extent to which I was really bothered by the way in which the Obama administration did not say clearly to the world, we're 100 percent behind. We are 100 percent behind. And it's tragic that Israel is put in a position where, because of the way in which Hamas uses hospitals and UN buildings, etc., civilians, people die. I, I agree I'm really with you 100 percent. But, but look, you know, I agree with you 100 percent. You are right. But look to the wider, to the wider world. What about the United Nations? What about Ban Ki Moon? What about what he said? It was despicable. What about what about we met with the international with the ICRC, the, the Red Cross, who co told us, you know, we have to be very careful. We go in conflict inside the conflict. It's our job to make sure yes. detainees are okay and the people in the conflict are okay. So did you ever ask that? Did you ever who do you talk to? Uh, we're close with the IDF, we're close with Magen David Adom. And who do you speak to on the other side? We talk to Hamas and Islamic Jihad. And when you talk to Hamas and Islamic Jihad, do you tell them, don't put weapons caches next to schools? Don't keep missiles next to hospitals? Well, that we're not, you know, we're, we're. Very frustrating. It's, a, it's it? very frustrating, yes. but it's very frustrating on the bigger okay. picture and I, as I well. I want the President of the United States to speak out when the United Nations does something outrageous in that regard. Agreed. Look, American, I don't, again, I don't want to sound overly Pollyannish, but American public opinion does remain, post-Gaza war and pre-Gaza war, it remains very heavily pro-Israel. Uh, one thing I think we often totally ignore is that 97% of the pro-Israel support in this country comes from Gentile sources and not from Jewish sources. Now, as the Jews hardly stand alone as this lone voice, Shalom TV, you know, still <laughs> crying in the wilderness, <laughs> saying we're the only people standing up for Israel. Um, Americans have been incredibly fair-minded, and again, one can quibble with certain aspects at one particular moment. I wasn't happy about a lot of things that took place. But the, the larger overall picture is that America, once again, you know, during this difficult period known as Operation Protective Edge, number one, gave us the Iron Dome system and stood by it. And number two, in terms of the international rhetoric concerning Israel, uh, America did say, perhaps not as loudly and as consistently as one might like, that Israel had the right to protect itself. It said it conditionally over and over again. And I'm not arguing with you. I'm not saying that the America is going anti-Israel. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm asking you, and, I'm, and I am reflecting what I hear now all the time. I, the emails I get, by the way, are just brutal from Jews who think that the administration is just, you know, they do demonize. All right. Look, Charles may not, but, but, but uh, no one's, hard, no one is, this, this discussion is not, is America, is America somehow abandoning Israel? No. The question is, is the leadership of this country as expressed in the executive and the White House in some way been disappointing? And many people have said that the midterm election we just experienced was in some way a repudiation of Barack Obama. And so one of the things that I wanted to hear the four of you talk about is, how do you feel the Jewish community is, is responding to Obama? And again, I'm also responding to emails that I get, and it's not necessarily this is what, my, what I think. And you know, I, I think not enough credit is given to the administration for the extent to which, again, as Eric said, both militarily and in terms of intelligence, there's been superb cooperation. Not only that, the Jewish community was very upset when, we, when, when Hegel was appointed. Hegel turns out to be a pretty good guy for Israel. So lo and behold, I think there's a lot to say, but at the same point, I'm hearing all the time just vicious criticism okay. of him. Um, and and I, I'm saying that I feel that it, that should, it should be understood and addressed. And, and okay. I, and I, and I um, last thing, and then I'll okay. stop. Very often, and the audience has to understand this, very often, you know, what you're hearing here is a discussion from, of four individuals who are basically left or right of center. I have no crazies here. There are crazies. In <laughs> this is certainly not, are. Yeah. Uh, there are no <laughs> crazies here. You have here very responsible, balanced positions, and you have people who are concerned but want to express it in, with a certain sense of responsibility. So I got no crazies here. But I want to tell you something. I will very, very often, 
lovely people like you're here discussing will say one thing on camera because they know it's the right thing to say. They will, they will adopt the, uh, the proper tone. The camera goes off. <laughs> I hear something totally different. And I respect the fact that they're careful of what they say in public. And they have a right to their personal, private positions off camera. I am not critical of any Jew who does that when they come on Shalom TV. But I am, okay, telling, well, you, I am telling you that the camera goes off. I've heard people who, who say to me how upset they are with the Obama administration, how they talk about how the Arab world is furious at the Obama administration, how that, they, that no one feels they can rely on him anymore in America, and that it is seriously hurting not American evangelical or popular support for Israel, but in a sophisticated way, diplomatic subtleties, it is hurting the state of Israel, and it is putting both Netanyahu in particular and the state of Israel in general, and I understand Eric's point that you can criticize many things that, that Israeli politicians say, but that our concern is What's the dynamic here that will in any way either undermine or in some way strengthen Israel's position on the national and international scene? I think, and I think also it's important to put into context, it's not just the Jewish community. If you look at the uh, former Secretary of Defense, many of the leading military people that have uh, retired from the service, there's been a, a slew of very responsible, very se serious, very senior, very respected uh, people criticizing the Obama administration uh, across the board. So this, there are very serious issues, and you're right. I think um, shock and, and wonder coming out of the Middle East from many countries, from many allies of the United States, has become regular. And I think that we are, there's a vacuum that's being created um, that is very dangerous to the Middle East. There's at least 300,000 Syrians that are, are, have been brutally murdered. There's millions of refugees. Syria and Iraq on the border of Israel is, is uh, crumbling. There are states crumbling in the region. And this vacuum is giving rise to very reactionary social forces that are genocidal in their anti-Semitism, sexist, homophobic, anti-moderate Muslim. They want to have a reactionary revolution in their societies. And we, uh, the human rights community, the Jewish community, and the I would say the Obama administration has been relatively silent, and I would even say in some cases, and I'm going to choose my words carefully uh, or consciously, that they've been aiding and abetting some of those reactionary forces. And that is just the reality. And I think we as a community who care deeply about this country and care deeply about the future and the stability and the safety of Israel need to have a serious discussion where we get beyond, you know, labeling each other as right-wing or left-wing or demonizing. I think that one of the most amazing privileges we have and, and, and rights in a democracy is that we don't have an emperor, that in, in democratic circles we are very much encouraged to responsibly but critically uh, critique our government and our policies with respect and with knowledge and with facts and have a, an open conversation. And the region, the context is in flux, Israel's in the middle of it, the centrifuges are spinning, and we don't know if the president's administration is really going to work out a responsible deal. And the fact that we don't know so close to this deadline, I think, speaks volumes. And it's giving oxygen in the streets of Paris. It's giving oxygen in the Middle East. And it's even giving oxygen in, in the corridors and classrooms of the finest universities in the Western world that, you know, there's certain things that are now part of the you know, respectable discourse from the Metropolitan Opera to the Ivy Leagues and the Oxbridges and the Serbons, we can now speak about Israel and Jews in certain ways that we would not do not too long ago. And, and I think this has to be addressed and confronted, and we have to find ways to really understand and deal with it. I, I, I think we need to have a good sense of what is and what is not going on in this country, and then we can turn to the substantive issues, which are critical issues. Again, I believe this election had virtually nothing to do with foreign policy and even less to do with the issues that are of particular concern to Jews in Israel. It was barely mentioned. I mean, there were some anti-Obama sound bites uh, about the Islamic State, and there were general issues of competence, which are appropriate issues, by the way, to be raised. It was not a foreign policy election. Um, the Republican Party had virtually nothing to say. 
Did they offer a clear alternative on a range of these issues? The answer is absolutely not. And in fact, uh, a major concern that I have as somebody who's sort of committed to an activist stance uh, around the world is what's happening in the Republican Party. Uh, you know, Rand Paul was a fringe candidate two years ago that I would have said we don't even have to talk about it. Uh, it's entirely possible that he could go to the Republican convention and emerge with 25 percent of the vote and uh, be a very significant force in terms of shaping the platform and, and that kind of thing. Uh, evangelicals, white Protestant evangelicals are decreasing in number. Just a major study it came out in the Atlantic. Very interesting numbers. Distressing for us because they are the most enthusiastic supporters of Israel who exist in the country. Their numbers are going down. We see that. The Republicans see that. Uh, there is no groundswell here among the American people on you know, a range of these issues. That's distressing. It's the fact. Um, so we, we need to be clear about that. Let's not assume the Americans are in an uproar because of what Obama is not doing about things that we care very deeply about that were not on the agenda of this election. But I think we have to be careful of, of something else. I mean, I, I, I agree that there are trends in the Republican Party as well that we have to be concerned about. I think there are, uh, and all the substantive issues that Charles raised are really foremost on our agenda. But I think we have to be very careful about manufacturing crises and uh, infla inflaming uh, situations because that will not allow us to be engaged. You have to be engaged with the administration, you have to be engaged with the elected officials, and you have to uh, keep that up without allowing some certain things that are really uh, side issues to derail, to derail us. And, and what's driving your concern? And what would you like the, you know, I, your, all the people who are watching you right now and listening to you right now, what are you telling them, don't let what become a crisis? Don't let chicken blank uh, get, get you hysterical, <laughs> and don't let uh, a moral debasement and such kinds of uh, throwback language back and forth, because that's not what this is about. Mm -hmm. That's not what this is about. Mm -hmm. What's important uh, is Iran and the existential threat to Israel and Europe and more. What is important is the, terrify the horrifyingly uh, uh, um, uh, uh, rise in uh, the fundamentalism and extremism that is affecting, that is threatening to Jews, Christians, Baha'i, everybody who isn't them, who are not uh, the extremists themselves, and the fact that uh, people are not understanding the threats that they really pose. Mm -hmm. That's what's really, we're allowing ourselves, or there are too many people allowing themselves to be derailed by the minor issue, the tafel, and they're ignoring the ikar, or what's really important. Mm -hmm. The fact, uh, Eric is correct in saying the election was fought on domestic issues. Personally, I find that somewhat dismaying. Uh, in other words, these foreign policy issues really are of great significance. Most elections are fought on domestic issues, and that's a comment about America, Americans' awareness of foreign policy issues. What concerns me uh, in terms of specific ramifications of it is to what extent will America abandon her internationalist role? which in mm -hmm. turn has ramifications mm -hmm. for the Middle East. Mm -hmm. In terms of the Jewish community though, and this is where I think we, we probably have failed, is that um, if you look at what our agenda has been in terms of Jewish communal life over the last, uh, the last four years, we have tried to make these issues to be front and center, whether it's Iran, whether it's terrorism, and not even from a Jewish point of view. No. From Human rights of, violations. Exact, exactly. We seem to have failed in doing that. Now this leads me though to this issue that of how does one relate to the Obama administration? First of all, in fairness, we've, we've all said we're not demonizing and we're not. There are sectors of the Jewish world that are demonizing. Some of them are sectors of the media, frankly, Mark, and uh, some of your colleagues. Uh, uh, other sectors... Yes, but just make sure you're not including me in this. Absolutely, absolutely <laughs> not. Absolutely <laughs> not. Right. But there are, sec there are sec <laughs> I've, I've seen the imagery of Obama's a thug on Jewish newspapers. Okay, I've seen the imagery of, of his uh, standing as if he's got a, a, you know, a cigarette in his mouth and looking as if he uh, you know, was basically part of a, a lineup. That, that really is demonization. One hears it, and you can hear it in sectors of the Jewish world. Um, that concerns me in terms of how we relate to these issues as a whole. The real challenge, though, and I think this is where Charles was sort of putting his finger on it, is that uh, will the Jewish, responsible Jewish leadership, the responsible Jewish community, hold the administration accountable 
when it does things that seem to be veering off uh, the path that it should be that it should be doing so. Say that again. The the criticism level that Jewish organizations, which, which I do here, yes, is that all too often we will parrot the administration line. Yes. Now the greatness of America is that it allows enormous leeway for the exercise of collective minority politics. Mm -hmm. And the role of Jewish organizations is precisely is that when the administration, regardless of whether it's Democratic or Republican, because we really are nonpartisan on these things, uh, when the administration does things that we feel are injurious, either to, as I say, America's international posture, or in terms of what we see as being the interests of uh, Israel, the Middle East, and American Jewry, we need to be outspoken about that. We could go down that, uh, th we could just discuss this for a period of time, but I want to make sure I get one more point in. We have been talking right now about the extent to which there are American Jews who may be uncomfortable with President Obama. We know that anybody who doesn't understand the extent to which there is criticism all the time, self-criticism in the state of Israel, just doesn't know Israel. But there was a cartoon in Haaretz that I want the four of you to see and comment on because, and I am now expressing my own personal opinion, I was it took my breath away and I am aghast by it and I can't understand for the life of me what, what provoked it and what this cartoon is trying to say. Sloan, can you put the cartoon up? The cartoon is appeared in Haaretz and it shows Prime Minister Netanyahu flying a plane with a big smile into what is a building that represents the World Trade Center. And this was in Haaretz, and I know there are people who really believe that the peace process has been thwarted by the Israeli Prime Minister, and that there are people who come on JBS all the time and tell me that really Mahmoud Abbas is the one who is in favor of a two-state solution, and that Prime Minister Netanyahu really is not, and he's held hostage by his own the right wing of his own party and that he can't do what he needs to do and that he will always find a way to stop the process from happening. But I see a cartoon like the one we just put up on the screen and I just wondered what, you know, how the four of you reacted to that. When you see that kind of cartoon, what, what, are, your, what are your thoughts? I, I don't understand it at all. You it's really, it's, no, I agree with you. It's really, uh, it, it feeds into the, first of all, it's, it's demonizing. It's demonizing. It's equating Prime Minister Netanyahu with with uh, the terrorists. It's just outrageous, and it's uh, I, I don't understand it at all. That kind of cartoon, um, and um, it again puts the blame uh, on uh, it puts the blame on Israel in trying to show that um, well because there isn't progress in the peace process, it's somehow Israel's fault. And not only is it Israel's fault. But then all the other problems that we have related to the Middle East, uh, it is the source of all the other problems related to the Middle East. And that is uh, something that we have, that we are, we counter daily. We hear this all the time. We hear it from Europeans, from the European Union, from different countries. Yes, well, but you see the problem is the, there's no progress in the peace talks and the Obama and the uh, Netanyahu, blah, 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 whatever it is. It's always somehow blaming this for all the other ills. And this feeds into it. Never mind that it's personally hateful, uh, which is, uh, I, I don't quite understand why they use this cartoon. Mm -hmm. What's your reaction to it? I agree with Betty. <laughs> that simple. <laughs> okay. What's your reaction to it? Um, in 1996, when, uh, when Netanyahu was elected the first time, I believe he was elected on a Tuesday, the Friday after the election, uh, Israeli intellectual and author Amos Oz, one of the most respected of Israeli intellectuals, Actually. He took to the pages of the New York Times for an op-ed piece which he called The Triumph of Israel's Dark Side. Now again, notwithstanding my enormous respect for Oz, and I've read many things by him, both political and literary, this was exactly the kind of demonization of Israeli politics that really is unacceptable. It's a free country, it's democratic elections, you can vote for one party, vote for another party, vote for a third party, too many parties to vote for, but you can't start saying that the person gets elected by, by a, a, um, a democratic vote, ought to be demonized. What I think the cartoon was doing, it's no secret, Haaretz does not like the Prime Minister, and we didn't need the cartoon to tell us that. What they were trying to say, I think, 
which I have heard in, uh, in, recent, uh, in recent months from other Israeli intellectuals, uh, is that uh, they feel the Prime Minister and the United States, number one, is on a are on a collision course, and that was the, the point of the, uh, the airplane, that um, uh, number two, they really do feel that um, the Prime Minister pays lip service to a two-state solution, doesn't really want it. Mm -hmm. My response to that is very simple, um, is that the reality is, is that he has not been tested, meaning that if you're serious about a two-state solution, come to the table, let's negotiate what that means, and let's negotiate how we can best implement it. Instead of that, there's been every excuse possible not to show up at the table. So that while the Prime Minister has um, undertaken different policies that one can uh, agree with or disagree with, I don't think we have room for demonization. Um, so in that respect, the cartoon is outrageous, but uh, again, it's no secret Harris doesn't like them. There are post-Zionist intellectuals who really feel Israel's future is being part of the Middle East, as opposed to being a, a pro-Western, liberal democratic government. And in that respect, they see Netanyahu's alignment with the, with the West as being detrimental to Israel's future. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I hear that. I think it's limited to a very small group of post-Zionist intellectuals, but oftentimes they have access to Israel's leading media, such as Haaretz. Well, first of all, as someone who writes for Haaretz. <laughs> <laughs> but Look, because I, you I, write for I, it, you don't represent it. I do it. not represent right. that. And um, in some ways, I find myself on the conservative side, which is an interesting place for me to be, <laughs> looking back over my, my past history. Look, it is possible, having listened to what Steve says, to to offer a centrist critique of Netanyahu that I think goes beyond what, what he just said, that doesn't demonize, but simply raises questions about the policies yes, that he's undertaken. Yes, but is it reflected in the cartoon? No, it is not. Okay, I want to come back to then, that point in one moment. Just your reaction to the cartoon. So I, I agree with much of what was said here, and I, um, I generally think we have, the context is there's a, this reactionary social movement that does not accept the other, that is gaining more and more power in the Middle East in this new vacuum that has been created. And there's a tendency uh, in the West and even among the Jewish, within the Jewish community to sort of blame the Jews or to blame certain types of Jews or certain types of Israelis for the failure of the peace process. And I'm reminded of the words of Emmanuel Levinas, the great Jewish philosopher who brought ethics into the uh, university philosophy departments. And he argued, based on Talmudic thought and Jewish ethics, that we become human the moment we see our, ourselves or our, our face in the face of the other. That's the instant we become human. And this social movement does not see Jews and many other others as human. I mean, we are, they, they argue we emanate from the urine of donkeys and we're descendants of apes and pigs and we need to be removed and we're the cause of all sorts of problems. So when you face a social movement like that, it's not possible to have reconciliation or peace. You can't have peace with people, with the Ku Klux Klan who thinks that African Americans are inferior. Right? And you can't have um, an egalitarian society when people think women have to be treated as property and hidden in a house and can't go to school. So when... But what's that got to do with the cartoon? Because I think this reflects in, in the cartoon the sort of the putting the onus and putting the blame as people do in certain discourses, public political discourses, the failure of the peace process on the stubborn Jews, on the stubborn Israelis. If only the Israelis and the stubborn Jews will change, there'll be the end of jihadism and terror and there will be, you know, international world redemption. And I think some on the left, a minority of the left, so a minority of the minority, tend to demonize people like Sheldon Adelson and, and Prime Minister Netanyahu in that way without maybe facing the, the, the more profound challenges of the region okay. that we find ourselves. So the five of us really find the cartoon despicable. But then I did want to ask you the question that you were heading towards. There are people who do feel Netanyahu has not done enough and is partially responsible, if not wholly responsible, for a lack of progress in the peace process. Where do you stand on that? And, and in general, do you have criticism of things either the Prime Minister has not yet done or things he has done? Well, it's absurd to suggest he's wholly responsible. That, Correct. That, that most of the responsibility rests with the Palestinian side and with the Arab side. So let's, let's start off with that. Uh, does the Prime Minister bear some responsibility, and do previous res uh, Israeli governments bear some responsibility for the current situation? Yes, even in light of 
Arab rejectionism, Israel's job, I believe, is to stand in readiness for peace. That means a commitment to a two-state solution. That means a Jewish and democratic state. And uh, the fact of the matter is, if you continue to settle beyond the settlement blocks, uh, which is what's been happening in Israel for the last 20 years, I mean, the number of settlers outside of the settlement blocks was about 35,000 in the early 1990s, and it's about 120,000 today. Those are facts on the ground. And what that means is a two-state solution um, may indeed be Become impossible, and a Jewish and democratic state, which is the heart of Zionism, to which I'm committed, I believe we're all committed, uh, will then be fatally undermined. So my, my question is, um, Netanyahu gave a speech in 2009 in which he said he was committed to a two-state solution, but in fact, in terms of actions on the ground, it hasn't been clear. And here and there, in terms of settlements, he's done some right things, on the other hand, has also been prepared to continue with settlement growth and uh, to turn away. Is that your major criticism? Yes, meaning there are two prongs. First of all, the specifics of settlement on the ground, those are issues of facts. Either they happen or they don't. Any settling beyond the settlement blocks, I think, is a terrible mistake. And second of all, I believe that the government of Israel and the prime minister, any prime minister and any government, needs to speak the language of separation of two states, of a Jewish and democratic Israel, and needs to do so emphatically, including at election time. Uh, and that has po important political consequences. What you say makes a difference. So uh, I, I don't believe that Antonio is the only prime minister who's had some issues in that regard, I want to say, both the right and the left. But he's been prime minister for a long time, and I think he could be doing better in that regard. The responsibility rests with the Arab. Let them take that responsibility. Let them bear that responsibility. People are distracted by these other things which are unnecessary. Do you agree with that analysis? I, I agree with large parts, por portions of it. Really two points. Um, number one, the great transformation in Israeli politics and polity of the last 25 years, since, since 1993, the last 22 years, has been the, uh, the movement towards a consensus by a two-state solution as essential for Israel's future as a, dem as a democracy and as a Jewish state. In that respect, the prime minister's statements are part of an overall change in Israeli, the overall Israeli consensus and something we should not lose sight of. Um, in that respect, his call for a Palestinian state at the Bar Ilan speech was part and parcel of an overall transformation that is, I think, very important and I hope to see someday it will happen, although I'm increasingly becoming skeptical of it. As far as the West Bank settlements are concerned, I, my disagreement with Eric is, is a limited one, and that is that um, the settlement policy one can have disagreements with, and I have my own disagreements with it. The question is, is in the context of a two-state solution that is negotiated, some settlements will have to go without, without question. And in that respect, uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it is, um, it's difficult to, uh, to envision uh, why, why numbers keep on increasing in areas that will not be part of a permanent state of Israel. That's a very legitimate criticism, but it is not the ultimate uh, existential obstacle preventing a two-state solution. Um, in other words, sure, it's a problem, but it's not the problem. And in that respect, uh, I guess to go back to our early discussion about the Obama administration, is that the American public does need to be educated in terms of thinking of how serious a problem are the settlements. There's lots of disagreement about them, and that's a very healthy debate. And again, I would say the settlements clearly are a problem, and some, some of them will clearly have to go, as the Prime Minister himself, by the way, did say in his Bar Ilan speech. However, in looking at the overall picture of what's preventing the two-state solution, you could have had a two-state solution in 1947. You could have had it in 1978 with Camp David. You could have had it during the Oslo years. You could have had it under Prime Minister Olmert. Each time the answer has been no, whether it's the right of a Palestinian right of return or whether it's coming around to the notion of uh, living alongside a Jewish state in perpetuity and in peace. So does it make sense to keep settling if that's the case? The distinctions need to be drawn. There are settlements and there are settlements. Betty said it, said it before. Um, if you look again at Netanyahu's record, um, the settlement growth that has taken place largely has been within, within areas that will be part of a future state of Israel. 
If there are exceptions to that, again, obviously those are regrettable. And you say? I feel that the settlements have been often used as an excuse to not make peace by the other side. There is a kind of a, a blindness uh, to the fact that most of the s settlement growth has happened within the settlements that are going to be uh, considered in the settlement block. But the whole issue of peace is we're not going to negotiate peace. The Europeans are not going to negotiate peace. The United States is not going to negotiate peace. The peace has to be made between the two parties that are uh, involved as mandated by the United Nations resolutions and that's what has to happen. And I feel that pressure coming from the international community, from different countries, from the European Union has always seemed to be uh, foisted on Israel and not enough on the other side. And that is really what's uh, uh, at the crux of the matter here. Peace will be made eventually if both sides come together. And we, How many times already has, have there been shelf agreements? They're, the agreements are there. And a little different, a little, a little uh, modified. They're there already. They've been discussed over and over. The two parties have to come together, and I think Israel has shown over and over that it's been willing to come to the table. Israel has shown over and over that it's made concessions and that it's, it wants peace, and I think we need to see the same commitment from the Palestinian side. Publicly, has the American administration pub, uh, pushed Israel? <sighs> has the American administration I put think pressure that, I mean, on I think Israel? I, f I feel definitely that uh, Secretary Kerry has been tougher publicly on the Israelis than he has been on the Palestinians. Okay. By the way, to me, it's dramatically more, more pressure has been put on Israel than it has been put on the Palestinians. And that I have a sense that if the Obama administration or if the American administration, whoever's in the White House, were ever to say to the Palestinians, understand, we're friends with Israel forever. They're ready to make a territorial compromise with you and share the land and we're not going to back away from Israel. So if you want a state, you have to share the land. That would be beneficial for the peace process. I haven't heard the administration say it. The thing that complicates uh, the United, the U.S.-Israel relationship, uh, which is always the elephant in the room, is the need for our country to have access to Arab oil, reasonably priced Arab oil in the Middle East. That is always there. That is always an important national interest of the United States. The United States has always had to navigate that with its commitment to its democratic ally, the only democratic ally that it has in the region. Uh, so that is perhaps I'm not giving it an excuse. Okay, I'm but saying the Palestinians that, uh, don't have oil. The Palestinians don't have oil, but the Palestinians are of the Arab world. So I think the Arab world seems less and less recently, recently because of all the issues. Yes, that's true, but I think that's a recent development uh, due to the uh, developments that Charles has been raising, yes. which is the uh, the the terrific concern that there is regarding the Islamist and extremist world. Look, when you're having people now telling you that uh, uh, Al-Qaeda thinks that ISIS is worse, is, is uh, fearsome, and there are other groups, uh, Al-Nusra, who was afraid of ISIL and, and these kinds of uh, um, these pronouncements, and when you have, you also hear about Arab countries that uh, are uh, more on the side of Israel than they are on the side of Iran, then uh, uh, that is a big shift. Mm. The question is how public is the Arab world or the Gulf states, let's say, particularly, who are threatened by Iran, willing to say so publicly? Uh, look, at jo look at Jordan. Jordan has been making pronouncements in these past few days that uh, are detrimental to Israel. Jordan is, be, is, uh, owes, is, is in existence today because of the backing that it gets from the Israeli government, which is also quiet. It's still, this is the backstreet girl of the Jordanian-Israeli relationship. We can't talk about it. Um, Jordan is threatened by an overwhelming number of Syrian refugees that have uh, in, uh, come there, and uh, which are a big destabilizing factor, but still. You still have this. This is a real problem. I, I was, I want to go back to the European Union for one second because they were the ones, uh, I had met with them during uh, a few months ago. They had had one of the representatives came to the United States. 
again, uh, the settlements, you have to tell Netanyahu the settlements. I said, what about the prisoner release that he just did? Uh, what about that? That got no recognition in the international press. That got no, I didn't hear any thanks from the United States, from the Palestinians, from the Arab world. What about that? Or from the European Union? We don't care about that. We care about, the, it's about the territory and the settlements. The prisoner release was a terrible idea. Well, it was a terrible idea. Why would you release murderers? This was a demand. This was a demand. No, it wasn't on behalf a demand. The United States said you have a choice. You can stop settlements or you can release terrorists. And for internal political reason, they released murderers. There was an uproar in the Israeli population, an uproar. There were, they did a poll. Some 70 to 80 percent of Israelis said you should have stopped settlements in order to enter the talks. You should not have released these, these prisoners. And then, as, as the negotiations proceeded, Netanyahu said, well, we're, we're not going to uh, fulfill our commitment to release, you know, the final group of prisoners. And, the, and I was in a briefing, and the Americans said, we didn't ask for this in the first place. But the but Palestinians if he made a if, if, asked for it, Eric. If he made, but if he made a commitment to us, then why didn't he keep the commitment that he chose to make? I mean, I, 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 I had to say something, because there could be no better example of a bungled policy that came directly out of internal concerns when uh, some kind of a settlement free would have been sufficient was supported by the citizens of Israel. These kinds of things are self-inflicted wounds. Hold the Palestinians responsible for their rejectionism and don't allow them to point the finger at Israel and at Jews. And this, this is what happened there. Any comment you have on the whole settlement issue? So, so I believe that as uh, I agree that um, there's sort of been this, in the last several decades, there's a, an agreement that there should be a two-state solution, and I, I agree with what, you, what Steve was saying earlier with the, with the settlements. Um, and I think as people around the table who want to see a two-state solution, I, would, I think it's incumbent upon our community to stress to the Obama administration to stop supporting the Muslim Brotherhood in Qatar, in Turkey, even among Palestinians, because this is giving oxygen, oxygen to the isolationist people who would never accept the self-determination of Jews or non-practicing Muslims on Islamic land. Can I ask what you're saying? I mean, you keep repeating that. Yes. Are you suggesting that is the issue that there should be no support or relations with Turkey? Are you specifically saying that the Muslim uh, Brotherhood elements within the government. Could could you just lay that out sure. for us so, so we know what you're saying? Okay, so let's uh, we'll take Qatar as yeah. an example. Say they were bankrolling Hamas. You you mm -hmm. you must agree with that. They were also supporting Hamas with sophisticated communications devices, which played an effective role yeah, but in the Turkey war. Turkey is more important. Turkey's is uh, may, may I finish? Yeah, please. Thank you. Which uh, played an important role in. Um, allowing, enabling Hamas to take this her, sort of horrific war against Israel uh, from, as Betty was saying, from in the midst of uh, heavily populated areas. And the Obama administration, Kerry in particular, played an active role on two occasions to bring Turkey and Qatar into the ceasefire agreements to the chagrin of the Israelis, to Fatah, to the Egyptians, and to the Saudis and the Jordanians. So my argument is this. If you want to have a two-state solution, we have to empower moderate Palestinians who will accept the right of non-Islamist Muslims uh, having self-determination in that part of the world. Because to the Islamists, everything is a settlement. You know, if, if we kept Ramad Gan, Agreed. if Jews have self-determination on Islamic land, it cannot even be Ramad Gan. It, it's finished. So to have a two-state solution, which you, I know, want to have, I think it's incumbent upon us to ensure that the Obama administration is supporting moderates in the Palestinian camp and around the, around the region, in Iran, in Egypt, uh, in, in all these societies. So these type of reconciliation and peace agreements can maybe, you know, God willing, be achieved. If, and if Obama is supporting and is supportive of, of Erdogan and, and Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood, Morsi, uh, amazingly, you know, thankfully they were eliminated from power, that when, when we're giving oxygen to these rejectionist social movements, it, we're never going to have peace. There'll never be a two-state solution. So what we can do in our community here in the United States, I think, is try to put pressure on the government to ensure that we're supporting moderate people who, you know, w with tough negotiations, will come out with a two-state solution. Two-state solution is about divorce. That's <laughs> what it's about. It's about divorce. 
So let's, mm -hmm. let's not talk in utopian terms about peace, <laughs> but it's about two people separating. They have different narratives. They have different cultures. And the, that's what happened after 47, is those who lived in Arab countries, some cases for centuries or millennia, were forced from their homes. So we need two people to separate from each other. The one exception will be those uh, Palestinians who have been living under Israeli sovereignty, who already have citizenship, mm -hmm. and who are already entwined with Israeli life. Apart from that, we're looking to separate. Steve said he would be surprised if any time in the near future there were, in fact, a peace agreement and a two-state solution. Do you, are you of the same opinion? I am, but as I said, Israel needs to stand in readiness. The barrier, the, the, you know, if there's going to be um, resistance to that, it needs to be coming from the Palestinian side and not from the Israeli side. I am not optimistic we will see it in the shorter term. I am optimistic we'll ultimately see it. Optimistic short term or no? No. 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 Not short term, definitely not, but they're not there yet. And long term means what for you, Betty? The prophets promised. The Gaza Evim Keves. It will happen. Yes, I don't know when I, or how. Yes, I, you've now said when, when you think of it. And? I concur. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we can afford to lose the dream of peace. In other words, it may be a far off, uh, a far off dream, but basically, number one, as Jews, we, we want to be optimistic. That's the basic Jewish, me Jewish message. Uh, in other words, history ultimately will move towards a more positive end. And number two is that uh, if we lose the dream of peace, if we say peace is simply impossible, we can't do anything about it, then your, your alternatives are much worse. You simply hunker down and you say we are not, uh, we're not interested in any kind of agreement. But, yeah. we, but we do dream of peace. Well, we do. No. We have to keep that dream yeah, alive. Right. That's yeah, right. Right. We, we yeah, have right. Absolutely. Uh, is Mahmoud Abbas a moderate? Um, is he a moderate in comparison to? Is he a moderate? <laughs> you talked about moderates. Around this table, people have talked about moderates. Is Mahmoud Abbas, you said we have to empower the moderate. Right. That was your phrase. Correct. Is Mahmoud Abbas a moderate? So I say the proof will be in the pudding. The proof will be if, <laughs> if he can lead the Palestinian Fatah, the moderate, the so-called moderates, to really recognizing the state of Israel as a Jewish state, a Jewish homeland. Um, and accepting a two-state solution and doing his best with his colleagues uh, to deliver it. That's not an answer. Well, I think the reality we have to deal is that there is this vacuum that's been created in the Middle East. Rea reactionary forces are gaining more and more support. I think we should never lose sight of the dream of peace. I think that the only solution will be a two-state solution if we're ever going to have a stop to this insanity. But we have to recognize that those who are assuming more and more power in the region and taking over more and more mosques in the world and taking over more and more governments in the world are rejectionists. They have a very narrow view of Islam, a, a very derogatory view of the other, and they'll never, this, will ne this reactionary movement will never accept the sovereignty or the self-determination of anybody other than themselves mm -hmm. or, or different than themselves, including the Jews and the Israelis. And we have to recognize that reality. And whether we're nice to them or not nice to them, they have a well-thought-out, deep philosophical, religious, political, and military worldview. And we have to take them very serious. We have to read them, engage them, understand them, and deal with that okay, emerging Okay, I want our audience to make sure they understand it. Are you describing Mahmoud Abbas? Mahmoud Abbas come, the Fatah comes from the, that root. The Muslim Brotherhood, uh, there's a strong connection between Fatah and the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, there's a stronger connection between Hamas and the mother, Muslim Brotherhood. Um, but Arafat and Abbas came from that root, and they claim that they are moderate and they you know, believe in modernization and modern nation states, and that they can do a deal. I hope they can. I, I, do I believe it? You know, Jews, we judge actions. I hope they'll be the actions of peace. I love these people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you should understand, they're at this table because I love them. And I could listen to them all day long and all night long. I thank you, Steve and Betty, Charles and Eric, thank you so much for spending so much time and, and being willing to, you know, bat ideas back and forth. Uh, I am putting an artificial close only because of the clock. We must continue. You have to promise you'll come back. You promise you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed hearing the ideas of Stephen Baim, Eric Yaffe, Betty Ehrenberg, and Charles Small. 
and that they've caused you to think a little bit about your own perspectives. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have of your own. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV on JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. <laughs>